Welcome back to Collider Jedi Council. We are talking about Star Wars like we do every Thursday. And like you saw in the beginning of that little graphic, join us on March 15th, live schmodown at the El Portal Theater. You can get your tickets. The link is in the description, fullscreenlive.com. Come out and join us. We're going to have a whole bunch of people there, and we're selling out. So there's a couple tickets left. Get them while you can. And the other thing is, if you guys saw the Hollywood Reporter article that came out yesterday, a lot of new changes happening with Collider. And there is going to be a town hall on Monday for you guys. Mark Ellis will be running it. He will field your questions. So whether you're part of a, a Facebook group, Twitter, um, they're going to send out a, a way for you guys to submit questions. Make sure on Monday, March 5th at 1 p.m., 10 a.m., PST, you guys are watching. We will answer all your questions. Anything you want to know, shoot them on over. But that's not why we're here today. We're here to talk about Star Wars. And joining me on the council, the Grand Moff, the Nemiroff. She's here. I'm so happy to be here. It's weird. This is my first council on this new desk. And mm. really, just ha like looking directly at you. It's much better. Instead of over to my, uh, over to my it's, shoulder. It's just better to have an open okay. conversation about Star Wars. We're going to do that today. And he is the main man, the Kylo, the Ken, the Ken Napsack. Hello, Ken. Hey. Hey. What's going on? Where'd you get that jacket? Uh, I think geek. Uh, I oh, dropped okay. cupcake frosting on it, and then I tried to clean that, <laughs> and now I have a yellow stain on my shirt. Oh, uh, like a bantha peat on it, but we're sticking with it. <laughs> when did that happen? I don't know. I, I just randomly have cupcakes. Did, did it happen today? Red no, frosting. no, it happened uh, a couple weeks a ago. A while ago. Well, yeah, and then I tried to wash it, and now I've got where it. Where is it? I don't see it. Well, good. I'm just, oh, right there. It. Oh, right was it, there. Was it, was it a good frosting? It's least? always good frosting. All right, fine. All right, let's get into this thing. We're going to talk about Star Wars movie news to where we just basically break down everything happening in the world of the movies with Star Wars. And there's, there's, we're leading up to Solo. We're getting closer and closer to Solo. So I'm sure that's one of the things we'll be talking about. But what's the first story? Uh, Solo. Oh, look at that. No, no, actually, that. but uh, one of the questions we've had about the Solo movie is when, when, when? Mm -hmm. We want to know how close is it going to be to the events of New Hope? That might uh, color our view of what Alden Aeronautic does with Han Solo. Well, the Hollywood, Report, Hollywood Reporter reported uh, that Del Rey, of course, they're behind most of the Star Wars books. Lucasfilm just put out some of the stuff. Uh, Del Rey released a timeline of some of the new books and all the uh, previous books, and it's interesting. Now, some novels, obviously, are going to jump time, so they right. have to kind of put them in a general thing, catalyst is an example that jumps time. But what's interesting is Lost the new stars, yeah. Lost Stars, great example that stretches a long way. Uh, Tarkin and then Timothy Zahn's Thrawn and A New Dawn. All the solo stuff is going to be kind of wedged in between there, not wedge until he's wedged right. book-wise. Last Shot, which is that novel we're going to talk a little bit about. We finally got a description of that. We'll discuss that in canon. Um, and then the novelization of Solo, a Star Wars story, takes place between Tarkin and A New Dawn. That's about three years. Sure. New Dawn is about 11 years before the events of A New Hope. Tarkin is 14 years. So you're looking at, uh, I'll give or take, 12 years before A New Hope is where Solo at least starts. That makes a little bit more sense to me now that you hear this, because I think one of my concerns was the fact I thought it, I had thought it always took place around three years before New Hope. And I was like, well, that's kind of tricky because we know what that version of Han Solo right. looks like, acts like 11, 12 years beforehand you can see the evolution. I mean, because just look at you and how you've evolved yeah. over the last 10 years. You know, it's, it's a different it's a different person. So I think it's a better, that's a better thing. Now, I think that also inside of the novel, you're going to go through certain time periods. You right. might see him when he's a really young kid, which I think would be interesting. I believe that no, the Clone Wars still going on. They were at the time. Uh, the well, no, no, it's about 19 years. Before, they're about five years out. If, if five it's, years it's out. It's five, six years at this time. Right, right, right. Okay, Good, so. Well, around this time, roughly Luke Skywalker would be eight years old. So okay. he was born at the time. But how old was yeah. Han Solo? Because Han Solo was like, he was about 10 years older than. Story wise, he's supposed to be about 30, I believe. And right. then Harrison was 34 when he shot right. it, roughly, okay. uh, give or take a few years. So he's so he was born during the Clone Wars because yeah. Luke was yeah. Luke was born essentially during the Clone Wars, yeah, the, the end of the, the Clone Wars. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so I wonder if we'll ever hear or anything, but the point is, it makes sense that this is where the time period would happen. I'm also more and more curious when the film comes out, how they expand that, what the politics will be like. And I don't think this is a Twitter question. I saw this somewhere yesterday. It was a Twitter discussion. Mm -hmm. I hope, and I don't think they're going to do it because I think they've kind of stopped doing it, but I hope we get a little bit of politics yep. in this movie. 
um, to see a little bit what the the scale and what it was like, especially the influence that it had on him. But Perry, you hear about the time period itself. What do you think? Well, based on what you just said, I have a feeling we're not getting that. That's mm. just my own prediction based on what we've seen in the trailer and also how they describe these two books. It just seems like they have a, a very specific focus on who this Han Solo is that we're experiencing right now, whether it's film or book canon. But with the uh, with the timeline thing, obviously the first thing I saw was headlines out there and it's, oh, it takes place before Rogue One. Just like, really? Right. That's yeah. the news we're covering right now? And uh, the age thing is throwing me off a little bit. So if he was supposed to be about 30 during A New Hope, and this is going to take place what, but between like 11, 14 so years, that, that like gap. 18 or so, yeah. right? It starts like he's 18 years old. I mean, but what would that's not, that, <laughs> He doesn't look 18 years old. I don't think that's where it ends up. I think mm -hmm. that he starts at 18 where they can, there's been many movies that have mm -hmm. ended with the character being, you know, in mid twenties and started with him at 18 years old. So I think that you'll start with him there and then it'll move forward and it'll probably land around the 25. I guess, yeah. but right now I have in my mind the only thing that I didn't like about I, Tanya, which is when she plays super young teenage Tanya yeah. and then the movie ends up with her kind of in right. that age range. Yeah, yeah, no, I know what you mean, but I, what's interesting about this time in the Lisa's start is, is I'm, I've been all on board, really excited for Solo since the stuff came out, but like you, I think that voice, right? We all went to that voice, that yeah. voice, which is not fair to Alden, but, but let's just, if, if you could actually look now and say t 10 to 12 years before, uh, New Hope, his voice is going to be different. I have radio air checks with me at 18, 19 years old. I'm, I'm like this. I'm like, hi, guys. Welcome to right, Rock yeah. Radio. So that, that makes me look at it even more and go, I can accept even more what's going on on screen. The voice doesn't bother me as much, though, because even because when you watch the first trailer and even the best in the galaxy, okay, fine. I don't need him to sound exactly. Right. I just want him to feel. I and mean, that's, that's what the, we keep reiterating. I just want him to feel like Han Solo. The scene that, that bothered me the most in the trailer was that scene at the very end when they're flying through yeah. and he's like, oh, I thought we got a problem there. No, we're fine. We're gonna be all right. I'm like, that didn't really seem like him. But I don't know the whole context of the scene. I don't know the whole context of, of where we, even when he's, he's you know, the, the whole thing when she says to him, I know who you really are. And he goes, what's that? Didn't seem like Han to me, mm -hmm. but I haven't seen the movie. That one feels really on the nose. The little joke in the Falcon at the end, though, that's something that I think his delivery was working really well really? for me. Yeah, yeah, it didn't work for me. And it, it's like when you think about something like this, as much as we want him to be just like Harrison Ford in this role, the closer he gets to that, the closer it could become to feeling like an imitation or an impression. To, I, and yeah, I don't want that It's at just all. a really fine line to walk. So it's going to be interesting to see how close he gets to one side or the other yeah, here. But that's my point. I don't want him to sound or feel like Harrison Ford. I want him to feel like Han Solo. For things that I've read in the novels, for stuff that I've seen in the comics, in the video games, in the movies, I want him to feel like Han Solo. The trailer so far, I'm not judging him yet because I haven't seen the two hour and two hour 10 movie yet. Just so far, I'm just like, not yet. So that, that's, just, that's just where I'm at. Well, well not yet, too, because we're also still... I mean, we've only seen so much footage well, of him, but that, so there's an acclimation good, process. A little, little sample size of what the audience is going. Some people are not there at all. I think mm -hmm. I'm a little more there than I was, yeah. and, and you're probably the same. So I, I think it's a good, good little uh, sample of what's going on out there. I yeah. think what's funny about it is that I'm, I find myself... It's so weird, because even though I find myself n not thinking that he is Han Solo, I do find myself more and more excited about the movie every mm -hmm. day. And I don't know if that's just because a new Star Wars movie is coming out, and... An, I just I think, want to see, I want to go back. I think that's a lot of it. A lot, lot of what it is, yeah. is new Star Wars in the theater. You know, you and I sat next to each other with Mark Ellis at the screening of Last Jedi, and I remember turning to you and go, I'm like, I don't think I'll ever get tired of a new Star Wars film in the movie. Right. And there was a point where I thought I would. Right. There was a point where we were talking two, two a year, all that kind of stuff. You know, I'm excited for the end of Rebels. I'm excited for a new book coming out. I'm excited for a new comic. Sometimes there's a little bit of a deluge that you're sure. kind of lost in. But yeah, I think once we're in that theater, we'll be on board. We'll I'll excited, never say yeah. no to anything, but I will admit that I think I think it might be a combination. And I'm, you know, I'm boxing in Disney here. I might It might be a combination of Black Panther taking my attention away right now with Infinity War coming up, but also how into Rebels I am that... I've hit a little bit of a lull. I seem to be just like fluctuating from week to week where the trailer came out and I loved it and yay, and right. then all of a sudden something else takes my attention Well, now. I keep going back to it. I keep yeah. watching the trailer and I love that music, although I'm bummed because I don't think any of that music's gonna yeah, be Yeah, it's the trailer music, yeah. But I'm I don't know. excited for it. Um, I really wanna see the new worlds. I wanna meet the new characters. I'm 
super curious to see Donald Glover as Lando, which yeah. I still feel he's going to be the steal of the whole movie. Um, and from what I hear in little rumblings, and I'm okay with this if this turns out to be the truth. From what I heard about the movie is that, from a couple of people who have um, heard things about it, is that the movie itself is really good. Mm -hmm. I've heard that the, the, fa the fact that the kid is okay, mm -hmm. or that it all is fine, but for the most part, um, it's, it's the other characters that shine. And if the movie works, the movie works for me. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's what I, I want a Star Wars adventure. If you give me a Star Wars adventure and he's just okay, or if he's doable, I can live yeah. with that. Yeah. And to your point, Barry, about a lull, I think it, it's important that we all give ourselves those lulls every now and then. I think there's sometimes this thought in this modern f fandom and age of Black Panther and stuff mm -hmm. that it's like you're always going to be geeked up and excited. It's, it's okay just to go sit in the corner, have a cup of hot chocolate, read a poem or something like that, and then come back to Star hot Wars. Hot chocolate? The is that from the Timothy Zahn novel? Uh, yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Lando taught Luke. Uh, what's next? Next up, let's talk some Obi-Wan, that Obi-Wan movie, that fabled Obi-Wan movie, one of my favorite subjects to discuss. And Joel Edgerton, this is kind of a repeat. I've heard this before, but every once in a while in the news cycle, stories kind of pick up when you're out promoting uh, movies. And Joel Edgerton, of course, played Uncle Owen in the prequels, Attack of the Clones and Revenge of the Sith, has said again he is very interested and would love to come back. And uh, he says, I'm looking for uh, a actual quote from here. And there's a nice article from uh, Joe.ie. Um, he talks about uh, uh, Liam Neeson coming back. He talks about the idea that, you know, no, nothing's confirmed, but he, he thinks uh, Uncle Owen should come back. He views him as someone, uh, I like the idea that Uncle Owen is one of those guys who has done some super cool shit, but has never bragged about it. My idea is that he could go out and have some adventure and then comes back, he comes and slips back in the unassuming moisture farmer role. Everyone talks about Obi-Wan being super cool owen secretly knows that he was there and he did some of this cool stuff too which i love that take on i'm going which is not unlike the story from a certain point of view anthology yeah. where uh, owen's kind of like i'll take care of my farm get out of here crazy space wizard you brought problems to my family so uh what do we think about this idea nothing is confirmed uh, about this movie even including stephen daldry directing it the writing but we're just kind of waiting can i break your heart yeah I'll break your heart. What's that? I don't believe this movie's going to happen anymore. You don't. I don't. Why? I, I don't feel it's going to happen anymore. I think that um, I think that they've made a heavy push and focus in between their little channel, in between the channels and the media with the, whether it's the, um, the Game of Thrones creators, Benny from right. Weiss, whether it's the Ryan Johnson trilogy, um, and the last thing we've really heard, even unofficially, was that Hollywood Reporter thing. We, the right. fans. I've yeah. been talking about this. There's been no mention. There's been nothing. Um, yeah. We'll start with the actual story itself. What I want Edgerton to come back, absolutely. Especially yeah. after seeing uh, Red Sparrow, how good of an actor mm -hmm. he is every single time he's out there. His idea, even how to tell a story, with he's a very good director as well, too. And I want to see him do another, I want to see him take another crack at directing. But, and the enthusiasm to come back, to be in it, yeah, I would love to see it. I just don't think it's going to happen anymore. And I, bums me out because I mm -hmm. think that it is the movie that I would have, even if I love Solo, I would have rather seen an Obi-Wan movie. Right. Uh, I just don't, and I don't want to keep getting into the same thing I keep going over every uh, week here when it comes to creative choices that are being made at Lucasfilm, but I, I think that there might be a disconnect sometime of what the fans want and then what's hot in the media. And I think that Obi-Wan is going to not see the light of day anytime soon. That's mm. my unfortunate point of view. I think I'm leaning in that direction now. And as much as I want to see something like this happen, every single day that goes by, I have a little less faith on about projects that they've not necessarily announced, but things that have leaked and things that have seemed obvious, especially something like an Obi-Wan movie where how long have we been talking about that? How many predictions have, oh, it's Star Wars Celebration, they're officially gonna announce it. Oh, right. at Comic-Con or something else, they're officially gonna announce it. They've yet to do it, but they've officially announced two sets of movies now, so. Officially, yeah. That seems to me like the thing that closes the door on this, which I don't think they have the bandwidth to do right now, yeah. unless Han Solo comes out and it shocks everyone and it winds up being one of the best Star Wars movies ever, which while I do still have faith in that movie, I don't think it's going to hit that kind of level. So I don't 
think they're going to explore this. But no. with his with his comments, I will second what you said. He is so good in Red Sparrow. I love the gift. I just love every. All, all of his choices are always very exciting to me. And he's one of those actors that I've never seen him give less than 100%. And I like his idea, too. I love the idea of getting another perspective on what was happening to Luke at that point in his life and what was going on kind of behind the scenes in order to make that happen. Yeah. Ken, what do you think? I'm sad. I'm going to go. I'm just going to walk away. I'm going to leave. I'm just okay. going to go. Right. Yeah, the Obi-Wan movie, uh, if that doesn't happen, uh, that's... That's one of those. That'll be a big loss. That'll be a big loss. I'm not going to be an angry internet tweeter, right. but uh, that 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 would be a big loss. Um, you know, because I think it's a story. And then you'll that have a cupcake, and I'll make you I'll feel have a better. Cupcake, yeah. It's a story that that could add a lot to the Star Star Wars lore. So, well, we'll see. We shall see. Yeah, I just, I mean, it it is one of those things. I just think that it, it, you have to when you go back, bring up the point that you just made, Perry. There was a conversation that Kathleen Kennedy had at one point where she was going to make an announcement for the next standalone film. And mm -hmm, she said, mm -hmm. I think she was even definitive enough to say it was happening in July or something. Yeah, or whatever yeah. she was. I believe that she was going to announce Obi-Wan. I believe that she was. And I believe that whether it was her or whoever, they couldn't agree on what the movie would look like, should look like. Um, and maybe once again, because they got a Benny off and Weiss, and because of the Ryan Johnson announced trilogy, the focus is going there. Which I, you know, my personal opinion is I wish that it wouldn't go there yet. I mm -hmm. wish that, I mean, as much as I would love to see if it is indeed an Old Republic movie, I don't know what the hell Ryan Johnson's mm -hmm. trilogy is going to look like, what it's going to be. I hope to God it's not Broom Kid, and I don't think it will be. No. But um, this is a movie I want to see before Solo. It's a movie that I would even, if someone said to me right now, you can only see episode nine or an Obi-Wan movie, I would take Obi-Wan. I would take Obi-Wan first because of what I think it could ultimately accomplish. And we're going to talk about this a lot later. But I think that both the comic book and the uh, Rebels has shown how interesting Obi-Wan yeah. could be. And, will, and would be, because if you look at what our, our buddy Stephen Stanton did with the voice of Obi-Wan mm -hmm. in that scene with Darth Maul and that shot, yeah. when Luke, Luke, and yeah. in the, it's like, oh, take me back there. Yeah. It did ultimately what Rogue One was able to do, but not just yeah. capitalize on you know old memories. Yeah, no, um, absolutely. I think there's so much to what could be in that story, not just with Obi-Wan, but the mm -hmm. time period, and if it was to tie into Vader, which I believe it should, if right. that was the way it's going, and and Uncle Owen, and and uh, you know maybe get Bonnie Bonnie uh, PS back as yeah. as Aunt Beru. I hope we're wrong. You I know? hope we're wrong, and I hope that very soon they make an announcement that it's going to happen. I hope that you're right that Solo knocks it out of the park, and then they say. All right, let's let's go let's go on with that Obi Wan, but I just because we haven't heard anything about it, I'm skeptical. All right, Ken, what's next? Well, let's go back to Solo, a movie we know is happening, and some international promotion stuff started to come out, and we got a movie poster, international movie poster, which I thought was really cool. I really like the look of that, um, that uh, old kind of gunslinger type of vibe there, a man and his dog, and uh, it also a little trailer came out, and I got, I watched it, I watched it a couple times. Nothing another, different. Nothing different, right? Nothing. Just maybe a little different. Like one cut. shot of like something with with like the moving yeah. of the ship. The, the the trailer itself, there's nothing different. Yeah. The poster, uh, I think Perry and I are going to differ a little bit on this, but um, I, I I enjoy the Falcon. Uh, the, I think that he looks a bit photoshopped. And I love the dust kind of coming up, but I love Chewie looks great. Uh, he, he doesn't look anything, you know, it, it looks like he looks photoshopped. It doesn't look like they're actually there. Um, that was exactly what I said it, okay. on Movie Talk today. Okay. This looks like, you know, like a clip art job. It Let's does. place these important things. And the forced depth that the dust gives it drives me nuts yeah, because I, it doesn't have the intended effect. I don't disagree with you there. I think that the sentiment is what I like. I like the sentiment of, of what it, it's it's a new it's again a new dawn there it is it, it it's kind of the two of them it shows it's going to be their story really about them kind of becoming friends and that to me is exciting the more and more i look at the falcon though and those complaints about how that doesn't look like the falcon yeah, it looks like that thing is going to go through the most damage we've mm -hmm. ever seen the falcon mm -hmm. go through because if you look at how clean it is when you see the opening of it. Right. You see how different it looks. It's going to get annihilated in this movie. It's going to go through what R two D two went through yeah. in Episode four. That would be something. And in scoreboard, that's the prediction I'm oh going to make. That's the prediction I'm going to make in scoreboard. So, um, and why does it say six twenty nine? Is that when it comes out there? Yeah. I guess okay. so. Yeah. That yeah. Makes sense. Um, um, yeah. I love. I, well, I mean, I love it. 
I love it. I, I'm no art school major there, Perry, but I love that. I just, I'm going to hang this in, uh, in my bedroom and just uh, go pew, pew, pew all day. I'm know? not I'm not an art major by any means, nor am I a Photoshop expert. I'll show you some of my Photoshop. It looks very Photoshopped. It it's just, sure it does. when you have so much iconic imagery, couldn't you do something a little more interesting? Just I a little bit, especially when you compare it to every other Star Wars poster yeah. we've gotten in the but, last three years. But what's your favorite, but in the last three years? My favorite Star Wars poster of all time is Little Annie, with the shadow up against yeah. the wall, that was pretty. Well, simple. and yeah. and that that is an interesting visual that says something, and especially with the shadow, that is natural depth that this doesn't have. But right. you and I sure. feel the same way about it, but a little different. But I, I do think that for both of us, not just you, it's nitpicky because I tell you why. Because when you hang that in a theater, and someone walks by it, and they see Han, they see Chewie, they see the Falcon, what's that? It does, it, it right away, it's mm -hmm. the intended mm -hmm. effect. You see, solo. It, it does the intended effect as far as a marketing, not as sure. far as just the look. Sure. It shows what is about to, it, it shows the two of them. It's their, and it looks like a Western, even the way he's got his hand near, near the blaster. He's right, it, it's, it, it does the job. I would argue that if I saw that hanging in a theater versus the domestic posters that we got, especially the one that says Solo, where you right. see him, I think the color palette in that also pops. It's like when you look at the color scheme in this, I feel like it will almost blend together. And, yeah, that's you know, that's may maybe brown. this is overanalyzing one international yeah. poster, but I don't know. The artwork for Star Wars has been so strong across the board sure. that I see something like this and, and I'm, I'm disappointed. That's fair. All right, what's next, Ken? All right. Our favorite and uh, national treasure, Mark Hamill, is going to be getting a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. The ceremony is going to be happening on March 8th at 8.30 a.m. Pacific time. If you are local or you want to come out and uh, get it, of course, the category is motion pictures. The ceremony will be at 6834 Hollywood Boulevard in front of the El Capitan Theater. So, um... This is uh, long overdue, though some some of you might not be familiar with the process. It's not just that uh, some g ruling body determines someone gets a star. You have to uh, raise funds. Groups have to put it together. So um, while it does seem weird that it's taken Hamill this long when he's been a star for so long, including his voice acting, uh, this makes some sort of sense with the push recently for what he is. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense, but it, it is it is too it, it's, it's it should happen. Yeah, should yeah. Happen. The first thing that came to my mind when I saw this news, how did he not have a star, especially for, for whatever reason, my mind went back to Hunger Games. It's like they got a star when right. Hunger Games came Who out. Uh, I, I remember pictures of, I think it was Jennifer Lawrence, Josh Hutcherson, really? and uh, Liam wow. Hemsworth all standing in front of the, the Chinese doing the handprint thing. Interesting. Um, yeah. But that's but that's the thing. They 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 raise the money. I think it's like ten thousand dollars or something for a star. So if we get enough people together, we can Jedi Council. Yeah, but how did he? How did no one raise ten thousand dollars for yeah. Luke Skywalker? I don't know. That should happen. I don't know. But the funny thing that I found out through this whole story was that Harrison Ford had a um, star uh, back in the fifties or sixties or whatever. Yeah, yeah, the too. other, <laughs> the other, the other Harrison Ford, yeah. which was. Very, did you see this story? I did not yeah. see that. So uh, Mark Hamill had posted after this story came out that. Fun thing is, it, when they were shooting the first Star Wars, Harrison was like, you know, I got a star in the Walk of Fame. He's like, what are you talking about? And they went, and it was like some old voiceover actor or, huh. or something, right? Yeah, yeah, something, something like, like that. An old, an old timey. Something like that. But, old timey um, guy. But I'm sure now there's two. If yes, not, there should be. You should be. Uh, yeah. But anyway, this is it's it's cool to the fact that he's being honored and and mm -hmm. that he had this kind of resurgence because of the the new trilogy. And I hope yeah. that, and I think that it's one of the Twitter questions, so I won't really go too into it. But I hope that. His role in Episode Nine is significant. Mm -hmm. I hope that it is not just if they were going to do something like Obi Wan or even Yoda from Last Jedi that they change that. And I hope mm -hmm. that JJ and um, Chris Terrio, right? right? Yes. I hope they give him a, a significant role because he's the last of the big three to be in the movie. Um, we know that he can. We know that he's one of the more powerful Jedi, and that if we can see what Yoda did and mm -hmm. what he was able to do and manipulate actual, being able to throw lightning down and all that stuff, then Luke should be able to appear more and do more. And I think that it would be, I think it would I think it'd really be kind of stomping their feet and putting their nose up at the fans if they don't, if they don't include him more in, in the next movie. I will yeah. agree with that. Also, there's other non-film material that suggests you can explore something like that in really new, creative, interesting, thoughtful ways. Right. So mm -hmm. I'd like to see that happen.
Yeah, and I just love that, like, like you said, the resurgence of Mark Hamill. Uh, it, it's someone who, who's been an ambassador for Star Wars for a very long time right. when a lot of other people backed away uh, and Harrison was grumpy about it and all that kind of stuff. And, and Mark Hamill always kind of remained. He's always been Luke Skywalker. He's had a wonderful career on the voice uh, acting side of things, which is is still a, a, and even sometimes harder as an actor to do. So he's he's got a great resume there. He's known there. But I love the resurgence. It's kind of this late reward, but a reward for someone who has loved uh, this property for a long time. Sure. Um, I don't know if this would really kind of fall into canon or if it would fall into the Star Wars movie news, but I guess it's more canon, but we'll talk about it anyways. The, the, um, the novelization of The Last Jedi is coming out right. really soon, and I don't think it's on, on the actual um, mm -mm. notes, but we're I know that we're getting copies very soon, so we're going to dive into that, and I'm very curious if what we will learn, I think Jason Fry is writing yep, yep. novelization, very good author, has done a bunch of different things, New York kid, so I'm... Um, New I'm, Yorker. He's a New York kid, so I'm, uh, I'm, happy, to, I'm, I'm happy and excited to, to read his version of, of The Last Jedi once it comes out, and it comes out, I think, in the next couple of weeks. So There's a we'll, lot of books coming out soon. Yeah, I believe, it's, I believe it's March 3rd, yeah, yeah, uh, on the newsstands, yeah. yeah. Yeah, okay, uh, what we got? What's All right, next story, you know, uh, we got the Academy Awards coming up there. You heard about the Oscars? I've about never, yeah, a little, uh, what is that? Little awards cotillion. They hand out some stuff, and there's a cash bar, as Letterman pointed out. All right, um, so now we got, uh, you, you know, last therapy. Yeah, uh, Oprah. Yeah. Uma. Uh, Last Jedi has been nominated for four Academy Awards, including one for Best of Visual Effects, and now we got some little shorts that were out showing some of the, the visual effects of the movie. Uh, you can take a look at ILM Visual, Efe visual FX, and they have some little featurettes of, of stuff that went into the throne room scene, Andy Serkis doing what Andy Serkis does so well, and a lot of the special effects. This is kind of a, a staple of Star Wars, Christian, because yeah. going back to that warehouse in Van Nuys to see how it's done is always fun. It is fun, It's and, it, and it's sometimes you do the you say, oh, do I want to see how it's made? But yeah, I want to see how the magic tricks come to be the magic tricks. And I got to, I watched a lot of the Andy Serkis stuff because, mm -hmm. you know, he, and I've said it many times, he's one of my favorite actors working today. And um, to see him going through all this and then watching, because I remember the early criticisms of how Snoke looked and you then right. you see it's so detailed from the scars to the little indents to the rotten teeth. I mean, there's so much to it. and. You see the eyebrow hair, man. Everything you see, everything that is that really you can find Andy Circus in there, and yeah. that's that's what I like about watching those things. And I always watch them with the the Apes franchise too. Is and Gollum, you can find him yeah. like that. It's not hard, and it shows like there's so much more to performance capture than people give credit to. But that's yeah. the stuff that really stood out. But these movies are they're they're gorgeous. They're brilliant the way that they that they always have been. It's been mm -hmm. a staple of what Star Wars is all about is the visual effects. I love this stuff. Yeah. I mean, obviously I love Oscars and I am rooting for this amongst other things in these categories though, but when you get to peel back the layers, that's my favorite thing about a visual effects reel is that, you know, I think a lot of folks out there, it's just, oh, he's in a motion capture suit, and then all of a sudden he becomes the character. Right. There are so many layers, down to this one over here where it says uh, it's a pass for sweat and saliva bubbles. Yeah. Every little detail counts. And there's there's one shot that in one of these pieces where it shows uh, like a scar on his face that, that almost looks like raw, yeah. and it creeps raw. me out. <laughs> Seeing that level of detail, though, is kind of disturbing. And then... You also have incredible uh, effects done in camera too. It's like when you see the stuff on crate where it was a truck driving yeah. away, right. spewing yes, red yeah. dust behind it. Cause that is hands down one of my favorite visuals in all of The Last right. Jedi. And to see how it's done, I, I mean, really, would you think I'd get in trouble if I just drove around town with red dust spewing out of my Mini Cooper? <laughs> no, I think, I think it's okay. I think it would fit. Right, you gotta okay. do it right at, during Oscar season though and put like a Last Jedi bumper on yeah. or something. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely love it. Yeah, love that. Love your looking favorite crate. Part? Yeah, well, I, I crates what I love crate. Crate's one of my favorite planets in Star Wars. Now I love playing it on Battlefront Two. I love the yeah. little Volp TCs running around and everything. So uh, to to see how they put it together with some uh, nice pickup trucks. That's uh, you too can make uh, the galaxy look great with a couple of uh, fair, fairly priced pickup trucks. And yeah, you talked about Andy Circus and, and true performance capture. I mean that that's that's what's going on here. Much better than Force Awakens. Snoke was Force Awakens was was underwhelming for a lot of us. Right. And to see it come. No, it was more. Here, it was Way more effective in yeah. this one. There's no to doubt. See about what it. they were capable of doing, though. In hindsight, looking back, I think this makes me like how Snoke was visualized mm -hmm. in Force Awakens even less. 
Also, what, what did it really mean to have him projected that particular way? Well, I think they just said that it goes Other to Other than bigger, having an imposing presence, I no, guess. No, it just goes to a bigger conversation was that they just didn't know what to do with him yet. They didn't, they, they wanted an intimidating emperor-like figure. They said, oh, it's going to be a hologram. And they didn't have any other ideas except that that's, it goes back to my, my and I'm going to address this a little later too, but it goes back to my bigger concern of the, you do your movie this way, you do your movie this way, you can do your movie this way. And I, I, I can't stand the argument, well, that's how the original trilogy was done. So there's a different time as far as like how you, you're going to plan it out. Like, I just, the, you know, Snoke would have, whether it's connected to Plagueis or Darth Bane or whoever the hell it was, even if it was somebody brand new, there should have been a narrative all the way, all the way through. And I think that when they started with that first movie, they didn't know who the hell he was. It's like, was he a Sith? No, I don't want Sith in this movie. How come? Because I wanted it to be something else. Okay, well, who's he going to be? We'll figure it out later. We'll let the next guy do it. That, that's, that's the overall, I mean, bigger concern. Um, but anyway, that's that. That's who it was. That's what Snoke. That's how it happened. And now we'll find out who the who the big bad is going to be. Whether it's Kylo Ren the whole way through, or whether it's not. That's what I'm rooting for. Kylo at, Ren. at this Kylo. point, if they if they no did, one else? if they did what they did with Snoke, no, I, I'm definitely leaning away from that now. If they did what they did with Snoke, because I think the best part about Snoke, other than you know the wonderful performance from Andy Serkis, the visual effects, all that is what he does for Kylo and Rey. Yeah. And when you have one last movie left in this trilogy, keep the focus on that. You could populate things around him to continue to build that character. I'm curious to see if the Knights of Ren or other past experiences come into play, but, but no, this is all leading to him being the big bad, or right. at least that is the impression I got from Force Unless Awakens Snoke and Last Jedi combined. Remember, the, 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 mm -hmm. good, the good news about Sith not being around is they don't have to follow the, room, the rule of there's mm -hmm. always a master's always an apprentice, because if he had it, because there was somewhere in a different novel or a different visual dictionary that he had another apprentice. Yeah. And fighting for the power could be something interesting if they, if they put together the right, the right villain. That idea makes a lot of sense, I fear what could happen if you just completely introduce a brand. If there was a if there was a more heavy-handed hint at that yeah. in Last Jedi, I think I would have been more inclined to get on board. I but there wasn't. I don't disagree with you, but that they have shown they don't care about that stuff in the first two movies. Um, so I think it very well could happen. And to be fair, not even them. If you look at like the first movie of the prequels, it's like Darth Maul, imposing villain, gone. Who's now Dooku? Gone by the beginning of the, of, the, of the third movie. So it's been a Star Wars thing to kind of do it that way, but who the hell knows? Ken, what's next? I, yeah. oh, you, well, ahead, no, I, just, I, I feel like I we really need a sad idea. trombone to cue every time I, we talk I, about I this. I really, really want Kylo to be on his own, unchained. I like the idea of someone else come along, but maybe that's why he's Kylo has to sacrifice himself yeah. for the greater good of the galaxy. Yeah. But I, I love the idea of get Snoke out of the way and have Kylo unchained in sure. charge with things going. All right, next article here. Uh, and, see, and this, uh, I don't... What is it? I want to call this web. I, this, is, this headline drives me absolutely insane. What is it? Tell me. The headline reads, The Last Jedi quietly killed another Star Wars tradition you might have missed. Go. This is well, a the chilling show. Yeah, yeah. That is an insulting... Right. Oh. It did something different. And, it, it's, and yeah. it's, what was it, the tradition? So the it, tradition is the Wilhelm scream was not found in this movie. All right. Yeah. But that, that's not a Star Wars tradition. Yes, no. it's been in every Star Wars movie, but it's also been in every other action movie of all time. The fact that it just didn't show up in this movie yeah. doesn't mean it was killed from no. Star Wars no. specifically. The one that it left out w that I was bummed about was um, I got a bad feeling. I have a bad no, feeling. No, no. BB 8 says it. When? BB 8. Yeah. That's the first thing BB 8 says. And that's Does why Poe said, mm -hmm. no, no, happy beeps, happy beeps. So it was a different take on it. It wasn't there out front. Oh, okay. That, it, but okay. But I just like the visual of a porg doing the traditional scream. That, 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 yeah, would, that would make scream. total Part, sense, the right? Tradition of yeah, the porg scream. This, 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 is, ah, this, is, ah. this is this is this is being nitpicky. This that this that's my being, point. This is being nitpicky. Because now it's guess what? Now it's gonna, you're gonna have a whole bunch of other people yeah. commenting on the fact that uh, da, 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 that's, that's silly. That's yeah. silly. So, so we didn't use the Willem scream. Who cares? Who cares? Who cares? It's the, fun, but it, who cares? Yeah. It's the, a, the fun, BBA thing, a fun tradition in a, a lot of classic tradition. movies. Yes, yeah. the BB-8 thing. It, that okay? Uh, I didn't know that, and that that's. Um, and, and you might not, again, it doesn't stand out because I missed it. You no. know, Ryan had to come out and say it. And say it, okay. But hey, hey that's a, from a certain point of view. Hey, you did it, you know? He did like, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, yeah. and someone, well, no one lost a limb. So what? 
well, God, Snoke lost everything, so well, I countered that. <laughs> right. So th that stuff is, is people being being. Yeah, there's, there's, there's that, no doubt about it. That was in there. I didn't put that there. We'll discuss it. I don't mean to be grumpy about You're it. Not, you should be grumpy. Write about what that. you want to write, no, but you should be grumpy about that. I think that, that I think that's a silly nitpick. Um, is, and that, that is that's everything. It. That's what we decide. Before now, before we get into what's the deal with canon, what I will say is, and this is fair a fair criticism, I think though too. There's no doubt about it. With the last couple of weeks, whether or not you've heard me talk about the canon stuff, or um, or uh, whether it's just in general about the way that my personal opinion, how I feel that Star Wars is is being creatively run, um, and, and I've seen the comments like, "Oh, you know, Hall's been been negative now. He used to be positive all the time." And, and when I was positive all the time, by the way, all I was I was I didn't see anything wrong with the franchise. Oh my goodness! And they're fair. You're fair to to say that. There is nothing, there is nothing that has changed my love of Star Wars. I love it very much, and that's one of the reasons I just, the way that I see it right now, I have a personal opinion on the creative leadership at Lucasfilm right now. That's just my personal take. You don't have to agree. There's some guy on Twitter every single time, Evan something. The guy loves everything that, that Kathleen Kennedy and Lucasfilm does, and he has the right to feel that way. I don't feel that way. I was going back and forth with him in DM, and I said, let's agree to disagree. I think that Dave Filoni should be the guy creatively. I think Kathleen Kennedy should be producing. She's a fantastic producer. She's a great producer. I just think that the overall arc of the way that she's running Star Wars right now, she's running it like a great film producer that takes in the, 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 the filmmaker, that is our talented filmmakers, says, do this, do this, do this. And it's not a matter, I think people are mis misinterpreting my take that I want all canon to just, oh, I want rebels and I want this person to show up in this. That's not what I'm saying. My point is that she was the one that came out in 2014 and they had this new thing to do in Star Wars that no other franchise ever could do or did. And that's everything we do, comics, TV shows, it's all part of one big timeline. And that is incredible because no one has done that. And it was a way to also resell stuff and, and on a marketing way to go back and say, oh, that character was there, what's that all about? Oh, you should go and watch this. Sell more books, do these types of things. Her focus is the films. And for the overall Star Wars brand, sure, that's what the bread and butter is. But she's never talking about Rebels. She's never talking about the books. She's never talking about the comics. She's the head of Lucasfilm, the creative. She should be talking about all these things. When I watch the Rebels recon and the big moments that happen, where is she? She's nowhere to be found. There's Filoni, there's, and I don't wanna hear that, oh, well, those are the people in charge of Rebels. She's the head of Lucasfilm creative. It all runs into her narrative. Now, the difference if you were looking at like Marvel and so, well, Marvel does this, Mar but Marvel's never said that all their stuff connects. She is the one that said it all connects. So when she says it, she should be out there talking about the biggest moment in Rebels that happens. Where is she? It just shows to me, she's not focused on that stuff. She's focused on being a big time movie producer, which she is, which she has earned. She's a great producer. My thoughts, and I'm not, I'm not behind the closed doors. I don't know what the hell goes on over there. I'd love to see her and Filoni. She's in charge of the production. He's in charge of the creative. Because when you watch Rebels, that guy gets it. Those are my thoughts. Oh, no, I don't, think, I don't think you're wrong at all. And I know, yeah, it's sometimes, it's also been a weird time. You saw what happened to Andy Gutierrez on Twitter It's kind of where they stem from. And I yeah, think people where, don't know how to, how to express themselves. Where a, a social media manager, Justin, I believe, who... who uh, used to be on the show. Used yeah. to be, yeah. You know, has a picture over his, over her shoulder. It's his desk, I believe, and it's got Luke crossed out. It was just some inner office joke, something going right. on, and people are look at Disney, the disrespect, and they attacked Andy for it right. because she was sitting down in front of it on camera. And I think what happens is inexcusable. Inexcusable. But what happens is in this business, as the world has, as as fandoms have, we can get a little. Uh, you know, you go on, you tweet something. I, I went to a, you know, a, a, an event and I put an Instagram photo and then someone comments, you know, you, you damn idiot, did, 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 because you like Ryan Johnson. And it's just like, 
Okay, so we get a little tired, and so it shows up here, and that's not fair to the audience, and that's what I think part of what you're addressing. Yeah. Your love of Star Wars is still there. We talk it about it every day. at all. Uh, my love is definitely there. Yeah, Perry, we're not sure about. No, no. <laughs> that's absolutely. not fair. So I think that's what you're being honest about is yeah, a little, little bit, uh, you know, it's hard sometimes, but we don't, want the, uh, that, we don't want to take the joy from the audience, and, and if that's been what you feel, then we're sorry. That's what we're trying to right. it's like, clear look, up a, here. I'm a Yankee fan. Okay. God bless you. Yes. Yeah, I'm a Yankee fan. As uh, am I. And you guys might have a different thing. You might be a Red Sox fan. You're not always in love with what the general manager is, what they're doing, what right, they're, right, right. the way that they're running the team. You're allowed to voice that as a fan. It doesn't mean that you hate it. And yeah, right now I'm in a place to where I'm questioning certain creative decisions. I think that's fair on my end. It's also fair on your end that you're just like, well, you know, I like the stuff when they're really positive about things. And, do, and I'm always going to be positive about Star Wars and the fact that I love it and I want to see more. I'm not, I'm never going to say no more Star Wars movies. Give right. me more, give me more, try to wait to improve it. I just think that there's more to be said. Like I, as I was watching those Rebels Recon videos and looking at how much Dave Filoni, and I've said it many times, is the heir apparent, and he's not getting a chance in the creative in the creative seat. He should be looked at not just because he's the voiceover or because he's the animation yeah, guy. I think that is wrong. I think the same reason we talked about this on Movie Talk, to where Claudia Gray, Christy Golden, James Lucino, let them write scripts, but no, they're the novel people, so they don't get looked at. And it just said a lot to me when the big one of the biggest moments in Rebels, and Kathleen Kennedy is nowhere to be found. She's never been a recon, and it seems to be. Well, that's their thing. This is mine. You're the one that made the announcement in 2014 that it all counts. Where are you? It's so disappointing. I mean, you, it, am I off base here? You're, I'm, you're not off base, and I, I'm one of the the people out there who love Force Awakens. I love Last Jedi. I'm very happy with what I have seen thus far, but. I value your opinion, and when you say what you've been saying the past couple of weeks, yeah, it's going to seep in, and it's hard not to connect the dots, because while I do understand the mind frame of approaching the new, I'll call it like the new iteration for a new generation to a point, just, you know, when we got, when Legends was not part of canon anymore, and with this new iteration of films, I understand the Lucasfilm approach of having Kathleen Kennedy be the face of film, right. have Dave Filoni be the face of animation and compartmentalizing that way, just so everybody out there, because not everybody out there is into the books, is into the right. comics. Is, she should is, be involved. She should be involved. I, I do think we're at a point where you can't avoid that just because we've seen it creep into the new films. Also, a lot of the stuff that exists outside of the films is introducing things that completely shakes up the whole dynamic of Star Wars right. and all the different areas you can go into and explore. And as the head of Lucasfilm and the head of the Star Wars film franchise, I do think she owes that kind of respect and attention to somebody who is, I mean, really shelling out a ton of money to devour all this material. And the other thing is, it's not just about appeasing fans who are watching Rebels or sure. appeasing people who are reading comic books. It's the fact that all this other material has incredible story yes. and incredible characters yes. with great depth. Why it expands aren't, the universe. Why aren't you yeah. tapping into that? And the most recent example that upset me a little bit, and I know some people out there feel differently and it's fair, is I was really disappointed with who Amalyn Holdo wound up being sure. in the movie. I think Laura Dern did a great job with what she had. She obviously had wonderful moments she in that movie. She was significantly movie. different than what she was supposed to, yeah. Significantly, and if I'm being honest, a less, sorry, a less interesting version of that character in Last Jedi. Yeah, well, I mean, I think that, and that's, and those are debatable, and I don't, disagree with you actually, but I think that the audience, if they wanted to debate of how she wind up showing up from when she was 16 to when she was 50, it's, it's debatable. But the, I think that the point is it's okay to, not everybody's gonna be Kevin Feige to where the head of creative, I mean, excuse me, the head of production and who makes all, all these big decisions is also the big creative guy. What I'm saying is why not just let Kathleen Kennedy run the majority of the production stuff and the overall narrative and storytelling and and creative vision of ultimately of what ties all of Star Wars together, put Filoni in the chair. He's shown he knows how to do it. It's like, and I know that there's also, you know, there's things to where working on movies and working on things for so very long, and people use the Feige example of Feige worked on a lot of other Marvel movies before he got into mm -hmm. the chair. And that's my point, as far as the production level goes, why can't there be a shared thing? Because on an overall, on movie making, Kathleen Kennedy is fantastic at making films, putting things together, because 
as much as we say that she's had problems with Lord and Miller, she had problems with J.J. Uh, Abrams from, from what we hear behind the scenes, she had problems with uh, Colin Trevorrow, and she's had these problems, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, and and what's his face from um, Gareth Edwards? Mm -hmm. She's had these problems. Well, she made them all work. Yeah. As a producer, mm -hmm. regardless of what you might think about the story, and that's a separate yeah, issue. Exactly. As a producer, she makes it work. She finds a way to connect them, to find it, to solve the problem. She is a problem solver. There is no argument there. There is nothing that can be said about her as a producer. But the creative, something's happening. Something is not working overall creative. I'm not saying, and I wouldn't, I would never be like, fire her, fire him, fire, that, that's, that's ridiculous. As far as a, to, to make the franchise just move a little bit differently, I think that the solution, again, this is just me, what the hell do I know, put Filoni in the chair. So you want, yeah, Kathleen Kennedy more as a studio head. Yes. When it, when it wasn't, yes. Which I always took it as that's what she was, but you're right, those comments, she, she's been the face of a lot of things. At the right. convention, she comes on out. And, but, you know, again, Feige, everyone goes to Feige. Well, Feige has bosses. Feige, Feige's right. running what you're describing, what you want, say, Filoni to do, and I think that's where a lot of, there's a lot of differences. Um, Kathleen Kennedy uh, will never be Feige because she's higher up, just like Feige answers to someone. Right. It's getting less and less that he's answering to, um, just like Iger's... Well, Perlmutter went away. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. But especially in the beginning, right. um, that's what sounds to me, if, I, if, I'm, if I'm breaking it down, that's what you want. Is you yeah. want her to ascend or stay where she is, more of a studio head. Yeah, yeah. Well, he is a studio here. head. Let Filoni, him, let him guide take charge of the creative. Or someone. Let Filoni work ship. with the directors. Let Filoni work with the story group. Let Filoni drive the narrative and then report to Kathleen Kennedy and say, we need this, 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 and this. Right. Who should we get? Let's take these meetings. To, and, and, and that's how you work. Like, I don't feel like he's being utilized. It's only being used in animation. It's also an impression that she gives off. And I'm not saying that her job description requires her to do just that, but in comparing her to a Kevin Feige, when you read interviews with Feige, there is an attention to fans of the source material. Right. There's a knowledge you can tell he has with the given movie he's talking about right now, but also how it pertains to the larger MCU. And I, I can't think of all that many in-depth Kathleen Kennedy in interviews that really have struck me from a creative level. And yes. I don't think there's anything wrong with that either. No, I no, think no, blending no. her abilities with a Filoni or someone like Filoni, I don't know if there's someone else in Lucasfilm who can do what he does, but I think he is a fantastic option. That is the perfect collaboration That is for a me. great point there because that is the point that I'm trying to make here. When you hear Feige talk about Marvel. He'll give you specific examples. He'll go deep cut. He'll make a lot of the movies deep cutty to where you'd be like, oh, maybe that's too inside baseball. But to the inside baseball fan, like Schnepp for a Marvel mm -hmm. movie, it might go over my head, but it doesn't hurt my experience. When you hear Kathleen Kennedy, this is just my observation, when you hear her talk about Star Wars, it feels like she's just giving the standard answer. She never really goes deep cutting into Star Wars. She's never really gone into the fact, I'm not saying she's not a fan of the property, otherwise she wouldn't have taken the job. Mm -hmm. But she's not all the way deep cutty. I, I, as far as like going into, I bet you Filoni sits down, reads all these comics, reads all these novels, figures out like what Pablo Hidalgo does and the story group does. And that's okay, I don't need Kathleen Kennedy to do that. Right. But I need her to do it if she's running the entire narrative. I need her to do that if she's the creative. I want, I want someone who's just in it all. What if we do this? And what if we do that? And no, that didn't necessarily work. We can't make that canon, but what if we do this? That's what, a, that's what a head of the creative should do to move us forward, to not say, oh, maybe people won't get that. That's not your job. I don't, that sh shouldn't be your job. It, your job should be, what do we need to make, what do you need from me in order to make, it, to, to make it happen, for me to produce this? That's your narrative, okay? You're the head of my, you're the head of my creative, go for it. It's, it's old school baseball of a general manager and a manager relationship. It's changed mm -hmm. drastically nowadays where the manager has to literally answer, answer inning by inning to the general manager and the ownership. But um, that's maybe more what's going on now at Lucasfilm. You're, right. You want old school, you want, I'm, want I'm school. Pat Gillick in the office, Bobby Cox well, is gonna be downstairs in the dugout. I'll get you the players, you make it well, work. Well, because who better when it comes to yeah. Filoni? Because the reason I say that, like, and yes, if they couldn't agree on Filoni, then you'd find someone else. But Filoni was the only guy there. He was, he was Lucas's Padawan. He was the guy every day in the room with him, learning the philosophies, learning the things. And he's a student. 
He knows, and the conversation that he has, you just see creatively what he's doing. And if you gave him a shot, if you just put him in a room with the directors, whether it's JJ or whether it's Benioff and Weiss, the stuff that he would connect and maneuver. Can you imagine what a Dave Filoni live action series produced would look like? I mean, it would be everything that you'd want from a Star Wars fan. It seems like such a smart way to go because we're constantly talking about the wider movie going audience versus super fans who read right. and just indulge in everything the franchise has to offer. Because I'm just, I'm picturing now, you know, having been to two Star Wars celebrations now, the vibe is different when Kathleen Kennedy takes the stage versus when a Dave Filoni right. takes the stage. And I'm not saying that one is bad and she doesn't have it's a good different. onstage it's presence. A different it is almost like like mom stepping out on stage and, and talking from, from yeah. a managerial producerial perspective, which I think is what she is best at and what she should embrace. Whereas he comes out and he almost talks to you like an equal. And if those two sensibilities came together, we could actually get the thing yes, that appeals to everybody. It's what Ken said, it's being the head of a studio. I could see I could see Kathleen Kennedy running Fox. I could see her, you know, running Sony. You could see her running all these. I mean, she's a powerful, strong producer who just is not the creative force that we need for Star Wars. I just, anyway, that's, uh, I'm not Bob Iger. I don't, I, I don't make, I don't make those ultimate decisions, Bye -bye. But, that's, but that's where I wanted to talk to you guys about it as far as how I felt about it. I know there's gonna be tons of conversation here because it's the title of the show, obviously, but I wanted to let everybody know that that's kind of where I'm, where I'm at. Has my love for Star Wars diminished at all? Not at all. If, if anything, it's gone up because I want to see new changes and I want to see new things because of stuff we're about to talk to talk about right now, even seeing more and more and more how I just think Filoni needs a bigger role. But Ken, now it's time we shift on into a little segment. What's the deal with canon? Yes. And what is the deal with canon? Star Wars Rebels put a lot of canon out there for us. Wolves in a Door, A World Between Worlds, were the uh, two episodes that were aired this week. We've all had a chance to see it. You guys broke it down. I broke it down myself in other spots. And it was, uh, at least the second episode, was, I'm calling that my favorite Rebels episode of all time. And that was over Twin Suns and then the Ahsoka versus hmm. Vader season two finale, which, yeah. of course, this uh, ties into. So I guess we should officially give spoiler warnings though. Yeah, we're going to do a spoiler. Normally, I know that in the past we've um, we've stayed away from spoilers on Rebels for this show, but because Ken wasn't on for when Perry and I talked about it, we want to get Ken's thoughts and kind of break it down a little bit. And I know this episode is going to be a little longer. I apologize to Cody um, in the back, but um, we it's just a good conversation. I want to keep it going. So um, Ken, let's talk spoilers here. The first thing people, I saw the conversations that people were having on Twitter, and some people were, were on board. I was certainly one of those people. Some people were against the use of time travel in Star Wars. Now, the time travel for me works because that's where it's based. It's in space, baby. It's like time, the time continuum, the way it works, it's time works on worlds. And time works when you're in this, this thing, in this place to where it's dimension. It worked, and I think that it also, it was a brilliant way to bring Ahsoka back. And when you, again, watching that Rebels Recon, and you see that this was always the plan, there was a shirt that Filoni released like two years ago or something when this came out, was Ahsoka in the the, the, the doorway. The card, with, yeah, yeah, with yeah. the wolves. Tops cards, yeah. So he's known for a long time. It was that narrative, that, that storytelling, which we're just talking about, mm -hmm. and getting there. And the emotion still tied into the fact of Kanan's death and Kanan's sacrifice. And now, the problem I had with the wolves was explained a little bit more of how Lothal uses these creatures in general and how they can be kind of vessels mm -hmm. um, and ultimately was one for Kanan. Okay. What, what were your overall thoughts? I mean, I know you said you love the episodes. Yeah, um, yeah, absolutely. What did you think? Which one did you like more and how did you feel about Ian McDermott coming back? Well, that was great. A World Between Worlds was great. Wilson Dorbs was, was I'm not set up in a, in a bad way, but like no. these, these, these are two episodes. This, this is one place. episode. Yeah. But A World Between Worlds, the second half of this was was amazing. To see and hear, I should say, Ian McDiarmid come back with Revenge of the Sith Passion. That is what, when he's cackling at Yoda at the end of <laughs> Sith, that's what's going on here. To hear, um, and, and I think Filoni said in Rebels Recon, just to hear Ian McDiarmid say names... Ezra Bridger, Ahsoka Tano that he created and, and have the actual Emperor. And this is, of course, nothing against uh, Whitworth. Whitworth does a spectacular job. That's right. It sounds um, just like him. So I, I, I love that, uh, um, that uh, you know, we got to see that, see it connected, see these worlds together. And I uh, love what is... Uh, 
the time. The, I want to go with the time. I'm stuck on sure. the time travel. I am very much against time travel. I'm a Game of Thrones, Song of Ice and Fire fan, and Bran is a stretch. Like, yeah. But I like it, and I love what's going on. This, I didn't see it as time travel until I kind of stopped and thought about right. it, uh, which I which I enjoy. Because if it was just regular time travel, come on, the ghost crew, we're going to go back in time. It was right. something different, paradimen- you know, these, these multiple dimensions. Uh, I really, really enjoyed that, and I love that, again, this had... This had this this connective thread that that, yeah. that Filoni got to finish and is getting to finish his story. Perry, it is a very literal way to do what we've been talking about almost this entire show, which is connect everything. And yeah. in an instant, it basically gives you one frame that shows you yeah. everything is linked. And you know, I'm skeptical about time travel too. This was done so well in ways that that even though because when we were talking about it, I wasn't sure if uh, Filoni had planned this before. Right. Or there this are is moments. The- it wasn't like you couldn't go to a specific a specific thing. It was it was one particular moment you can get yourself involved in, and ultimately led to Kane, and you can't do anything about it. But whether yeah. he had naturally come to the decision to structure this episode like this over time, whether he had had this in his his head uh, two years ago or whatnot. It doesn't matter because in the context of what we see in this single episode, it naturally moves there and it feels real. And when you're talking about such an extreme scenario where he's walking through a wall created through a portal created by drawn wolves and stepping into the sphere where he can manipulate things that have happened in the past. The fact that that felt so right to me is still I'm kind of rattled and weirded out by it. And that goes back to what I was saying before about incorporating Luke into uh, episode. Episode nine, you have this brilliant, brilliant, well thought out and developed concept right now in this interesting sphere to play in. Do that. And I'm not saying do it in the exact same way as we see it used here, but there has to be other ways to use this environment that we didn't see in Rebels that could bring back Luke in a not traditional force ghost way. Sure. Yeah, I mean, look, this, you know, mm-hmm. your point that you made, Perry, before, I think was mm-hmm. spot on when it came to how it all connects and that was part of the rebels recon when you see it you walk into that room with him and because his time isn't really a thing where he is you hear you hear ray star wars is playing by the way did a really good breakdown yeah of all, alex all really the, nailed uh, it there. he nailed it every voice every movie was in, uh, other than i think the clone wars movies but other stuff the clone wars was in there yeah, he yeah. used everything because it all like you said it all connects and that goes yeah. back to the conversation we were just having it all counts and it all counts for what's happening in this universe, uh, in the actual canon of it all, and as a fan. So it all counts, and that was what was so good. This was a this was an episode for Star Wars fans, all the way around. I think that if you just yes. caught this as a Star Wars, like, you wouldn't cut, if you just walked into it, you'd be a little confused, obviously, with some of the characters or whatnot, but. You'd get it. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, sorry, I, I cut you off there. No, you fine. just, uh, uh, I was getting, I'm getting a little lost in my head because there's so much to break yeah, down in this. Yeah. But you just said because I know some some really dedicated Star Wars fans who didn't really watch Clone Wars and did not see or even really pay attention to the Mortis arc. Mm-hmm. And so we were having a conversation. He's like, I, it, it was it was good, um, but I I, uh, I didn't connect with it, which is the basic. And I love the Mortis arc because right. it is straight from George Lucas. That, George wanted it. this. Mm-hmm. Sto- yeah. This is these Force wheels. Yep. It's important. It's part of what's going on. So to see it play out here, that was you, you mentioned. You made me think about it. Where if, if you weren't connected with some of the other stuff, this this might seem a little weird that these paintings are moving. What does that mean? I I, I loved it, and, and it does yeah. speak to what you're saying about a, having the ability to tell your connected story. It's a connected story, it but it, but like you said, these are the ideals of what George Lucas wanted, what he incorporated, what he wanted to do. As far as no one's ever argued. I mean, I will argue to that that I don't think George Lucas is a great director or a great writer. I think he's one of the most brilliant storytellers of all time. Of all time. And I think that his elements, the stories that he helped develop, were passed on He's, he, you know, he's he's the the, the man, and he's passing it on mm-hmm. to Filoni, and you can see it here. So, it just I think that kind of overall went into my my diatribe, if you will, before. So that's uh, that's just kind of how I'm feeling. Well, no, and to go back to like I am I think you're absolutely right on on some of the scat. Not to go back to Kathleen Kennedy yeah. stuff. I'm a, I've been a little bit more. I'm okay with eight, seven, and eight being their own, not own thing, but just kind of they're the big screen, and and a lot of this stuff, you know, it's good. 
I like it where it is, but I don't, I don't, I don't worry about it being connected. But to see this and, and to know what Filoni knows about Star Wars, and, and he, I think he's handpicked by George to totally. be the keeper of the flame in a lot Just of ways. Just not I think. It's it, true. It, and and uh, t- it, it was a powerful reminder of, of what this, this is right. and what this could even be more. And maybe with the new movies and everything, they can do that a little bit more. So I want to say, to give you credit, like I was like, ah, yeah, yeah, this is, this is a good... Good, good evidence to submit to the courts yeah. on your behalf. It's your just behalf. making me think of what I brought up on the review, just when he first steps into there and you see, you hear all the different voices, that shows what happens when you continue to build on top of each other and all of a sudden you just throw all that in someone's face. So right. yeah, yeah. It, it is, it's a little weird having that conversation that we were having earlier be in the forefront sure. right now and then getting an episode like this, which is why I think that conversation is intensified now because one episode in particular is actual proof that this could enhance everything for everyone. All right, Ken. So I think what we should do here, because I want to get to the Twitter questions and we're yeah, going to go along. Yeah. Can you kind of summarize the other canon stories so everybody sure, knows we, what's going we on? We do have a, a trailer for the series finale of Rebels and some HD photos. It's uh, really cool stuff. It seems like yeah, they've got a lot to tie up in a short amount of time, even though we're looking at about 90 minutes of programming. Yeah. Uh, the pictures look good. I love Thrawn holding kind of the, the Jedi Temple Guard thing, which is that tied to the Grand Inquisitor, to something else. I, I, I love all that. I still, my wild hair prediction is that Thrawn pulls a bit of a swerve and doesn't join the rebellion, but tires of the empire mm. and mm-hmm. heads back to uh, the unknown regions for yeah. some reason. Also, we got a plot synopsis for the last shot, Star Wars last shot, which is a Han and Lando novel. Uh, you can check these stories out online, but it's interesting. It, it will uh, take place before Solo and deal with kind of a uh, Lando dealing with a uh, space pirate, kind of a bad villain named, F- uh, a criminal named Faison Gore. Okay. Uh, and then, we get uh, 10 years uh, later, uh, following the events of Return of the Jedi, we're going to see Gore come back and oh, wow. Lando kind of reconnect with Han. Now, granted, they're, they're already connected by this point right, with the right. Rebellion. Um, and, uh, with the, and this is my fa- with the assistance of a young hotshot pilot, an Ewok slicer prodigy. That's right. An Ewok will be back in this the kids' show. novel. <laughs> no, it's no, not. Okay. No, it's the young not. adult one's the other one. Okay. Uh, and the the woman who might be the love of Lando's life. I don't know if that's Santa Staros or anyone else. We don't know. So it's gonna span some time in the Star okay. Wars galaxy. All right. I mean, so that's everything. That's canon, baby. All right. That's everything in canon. I know that we just kind of went off program a little bit, but this is a conversation that we wanted to have and wanted to have with you guys. Now I know there are going to be a lot of people out there that are going to have good conversations conversations out there. I challenge you, even if I know that, you know, the internet gives you a chance to just be nasty if you want to be nasty. And I'm sure I know there's going to be a lot of people that do that. And that's your prerogative. But for the people who want to be considerate and want to have good conversations, have those conversations in the comment section, share this video, let people know that we're talking about it and that you're talking about it. Talk about it on Twitter. Um, I'm always up for, as are all of us, up for good conversations on Twitter about the things that we're talking about is once again, like Andy Gutierrez said, as long as people are nice, because the guy that was having the conversation with her, it wasn't a matter of what he was saying. It was the way he was saying it to her. He was being uh, he was being a douche, to be honest, and she just kind of had enough, and it was just a matter of... Well, yeah. it was a little bit what he was saying, because he's convinced there's this Disney-wide Lucasfilm thing to disrespect Luke Skywalker. Well, but yeah, but I mean, <laughs> yes, but I mean, you can still say that. You can still sure. present that in a way of, yeah, look, I, you can write... At Andy, you know, you say, listen, I wanted to say that I got to be honest. I saw that picture and it, it bothered me a little bit because I'm a fan of Luke and I thought the way you guys handle are handling it, I'm not the biggest fan of. So I just wanted to share my opinion. She's not going to go after you for something saying something like that. It's the, if you aggressively go after someone like that, you're being right. a, a, a turd. Yeah. No, absolutely. He, he but was. tinfoil hat theories and yeah. So let's go from you guys here. Now we're going to take some tweets and some Facebook messages. You guys went on to Twitter and hashtag Collider Jedi Council. You joined the Collider Jedi Council group, and we are going to talk to all you guys. And before we do that, I also want to give a nice shout out to our friends over at StarWarsNewsNet.com. Put together all these stories, and you can read all their articles that they have over there, original articles, podcasts, and they take stories from all over the web. They put them together, and it's the the best Star Wars site, so go and check out our buddies over at StarWarsNewsNet.com. All right, Ken, what's first? All right, first one up, some Paul Reaper at Reaps11. What are the chances that Rey returns to Aktu between Episode 8 and 9 to retrieve Luke's belongings and Jedi artifacts? I mean, 
the chances of her of us seeing her go back there um well he says between eight and nine. between eight and nine i think there's a there's a possibility i don't think we're going to see it yeah i think there's a possibility because look the x-wing is still there um mm. which would be interesting if they if they mm. got any of the stuff uh, out of the x-wing if they got any of the stuff that he had there obviously the whatever was in that hut got blown mm. up when yoda did his little tricks mm -hmm. um but i think um whether that's revealed in a novel or whether that's revealed somewhere else, yeah, why not? But I don't think we're going back to Skellig Michael Island. I'm going to go with a no on this one. One, because it almost would feel like she's backtracking in her journey mm -hmm. to me. And for all I know, they could find a way to work it into a story that doesn't give me that impression. But in my mind right now, that's what it would look like. Also, I think it would take away from the fact that she took the books because if she took all that stuff wouldn't she have taken other things that she wanted well but the thing was that luke at that point hadn't passed so right. when going back there to honor his memory again we don't know what's going to be going on with leia at that point if they're if they're going to say because mm -hmm. I, at this point i know i know when, when we didn't see the last jedi i thought it was possible that they could recast her they're yeah. not recasting her they're gonna no. they're gonna probably start the movie with her passed on and maybe there's other things they wanted to get, whether it's Luke's stuff is, are now relics, you know, mm -hmm. the, 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 the cape, the, th the yeah, things and, that he had and there. The crystal so, and everything. Yeah, yeah, right. The the compass, you know, like, yeah. I don't know if the compass mm -hmm. blew up, but who knows? But <laughs> Ken, what do you think? Um, I think in nine, chances are zero. I think it's a great point, Perry, of, of her backtracking. Uh, but off off camera, between eight and nine, depending on the time, if she's learning, if she goes on her own journey, I mean, I would... I think they end it with this peace and purpose, Luke's gone, everything, but wouldn't, if you had the power to go back to that planet where you were the only people that know, wouldn't you want to, like, you? eh, let me just go make sure that right. Luke is dead. Right. It just comes check across in with like she's got her hands pretty full. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But could, I, could you I imagine if after getting on, uh, getting on that ship with all those people, she's just like, hold on one second, on. I'll be right no, back. I, right. No, you're absolutely right. I think the story's going this way, but that's why there's time and she goes on her own, you know, much like Luke after the events of Return of the Jedi, he's going to go learn about what it means to be a Jedi. I could see something in there, but most likely I think they're just going to let it go. All right. And that includes in story. What's that? All right. Gianni Marinucci asks, will we see Luke in episode nine in a way we have never seen a force ghost before an almost human force ghost to interact with the real world? Or will he uh, not be there at all? I get the feeling that Lucasfilm and Mark Hamill have a tricky relationship because he is so honest. He definitely is. So what do you think? I think it would be an absolute travesty if they don't put him in the movie. I think yeah. it would be an absolute backlash if you didn't put him in the movie. Um, he'll be in the movie. Now, mm -hmm. the question mm -hmm. is how and at what form he is one of the more powerful Jedis, Jedi that we have seen so um i don't think that everyone's going to necessarily have to interact with him and that he's going to show up at meetings and whatnot but i think that he will be there with ray he might be able to be there for some of the jedi if they go that route and ray is indeed training other jedi at this point i think that it would be beneficial to them to the fact that he can actually help train the other jedi because mm -hmm. i think you run into tricky situations when you have someone who because you could talk about Yoda training Luke, and because of the time difference and the way that time moves, and he might have had a lot of time on Dagobah to learn a lot more, you know, and then that in between time between um, where it was with Empire and then Jedi that he trained himself, he learned more, and he became a student of the game. And he had, he had Obi Wan, you know, he had these things there to become a trained Jedi. What has Ray really had? A couple of lessons with Luke? Right the instinct so i think that you kind of need him to help train her i think that you should have mm -hmm. him train her and you should also have him train the other jedi and that way the fans go oh luke he never really was gone because he says it in the movie he mm -hmm. and he, he says to kylo see you around kid right he'll be around i like the idea of kylo excuse me not kylo not, not necessarily snoke but some kind of supernatural battle some kind of supernatural reason for luke to be there uh some kind of force ghost battle the likes with, with which we've never seen or another another presence that kind of thing i really i really like that idea um and i think there's a need in the real world for mark hamill to be in this movie yeah i would be very upset if he was not in this movie and i'm one of the ones who likes the way he went out i think they mm -hmm. earned the ability to do that it left him and the characters that need his help in an interesting place if they bring him back though i think it is imperative that they add another layer to the force ghost whether sure. it's introducing something like what is what rebels mm -hmm. has done or this is just a random thought that came to my mind i don't want kylo to go light or anything like that but we traditionally 
do you see that the mentor, the mentor type relationship, what if it went the other way? I, I don't really know what kind of avenue you could pursue sure. with Luke visiting Kylo and continuing that interaction, but something like that seems interesting and fresh to me if you're not going to add another layer to how he's physically presented on screen, what he can work with, or, or working with something like Rebels. Right. All right. Let's do two more. Two more. All right. Andrew Williams asks... Uh, everyone has been praising the look Donald Glover has as Lando, regardless of Solo is a success. If the new Lando is universally beloved by everybody, would it be smart to have Lando in Episode Nine now that Luke, Leia, and Han are gone? Um, I don't think that, regardless of whether or not uh, Glover is good in the role, I think Lando should be in it regardless. I mean, I think that it's, it, look, it's hard for Billy D. Williams. Billy D. Williams is what in his seventies or eighties right now. He, he's yes. He, yes, it's right. hard for him to get around. It's yes. not it's not as bad as say like um, Peter Mayhew, mm -hmm. but he's not as mobile as mm -hmm. he was. But you can do something. This is another reason why I hope they bring back a little bit more politics because mm -hmm. there's stuff. There's still other places and other people they need to recruit. And there's other. I, I want them. They've done space now. A right. lot of space. A lot know, of space. And let's now go to other planets. Let's do very similar to like say Game of Thrones when they were trying to court people to join their side. Right. Yeah. Uh, let's see a little bit more of that. What's Lando doing there? You can have Billy Dee Williams kind of sitting down, have a couple conversations, mm -hmm. move along. You don't need him to be active. Yeah. But yes, I would like to see him in there. And it's and I do think we just had the conversation that Mark Hamill, I believe, will be in the movie anyway. So it's not just because you're losing the big three, because I think he'll be there. But Billy Dee Williams should have his day, at least one scene. I would think the same thing. And also, didn't Ryan Johnson have a quote once that he was part of? Uh... Well, no, no. The, 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 the thought, because I hear a lot of, shouldn't have Lando been in oh, Canto Bight? Oh, and then, this was uh, the yeah, thing, yeah. 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 He, Lando yeah. thought, uh, Ryan thought about it, but thought it would, it would, it would cheapen the character. Which right. makes a lot of sense. Yeah, it's yeah. just yeah. jumping off that point. If it was ever on their mind before... I would, th I mean, it kind of is now or never, unless they're going to continue on with this younger Lando. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I absolutely want to see Lando in episode nine. There's, so, there are some issues. I mean, ability is eighty. Not that he's, he's not like he's up and mobile. Right. The guy goes to conventions all the time. But I think a Let's lot move of around fast. A though. lot of people when they're, yeah. they're, they're like, he should do this. It's like, he, I don't think he can. We need right. to refine the way to use Lando, which is why him. I don't didn't want him in Canto Bite. Would I? Liked him as instead of Maz Kanata, yeah, because I'm not a huge fan of that Maz moment in Last Jedi. Yeah. That would have been interesting, but again, this is a giant character. And Force Awakens, the Last Jedi, do take place in a short, compact amount of time. Uh, this character of Shriv that was created in Battlefront 2 is very popular, tied to Lando. Uh, we know that he's going to look for help. Well, if Lando's still alive, and Lando's still out, and he just found out his buddy died, and it's been a couple days, um, and there's this battle going on, and his old buddy Shriv shows up, I think Lando could be one of the reinforcements right. in Episode 9. Well, that'd be great. All right, last one. Last one is coming from Ryan Cooley. His score was great before, but in these last two weeks, Kevin Kiner has stepped up. Star Wars Rebels music has uh, stepped up Star Wars Re Rebels mu music to another level. He should be in one of the films. Now, what film do you think he should be on? Any Kevin of them. Kiner. Any of them. Any of them. But it, I, I, I don't want to rehash the same conversation we had. I feel it's, that's the TV guy. That's the animation guy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Let's get so-and-so. Let's get this person let's get that person who did all these big films don't worry about the, the animation guy that's the animation guy and i think that's the mistake yeah. i bet you bet your ass that yeah. if at if that if dave filoni was running creative and had to so, but this is it actually contradicts what i was saying i think that still kathleen kennedy would make a, uh, the the call there but i think right. that um he'd be pushing for kevin kiner because kevin kiner's themes are great brilliant mm -hmm. that's great they are brilliant and that's that music with kanan mm -hmm. oof, so good the answer is yes he should he should score a star wars film um but i don't see it happening anytime soon that's unfortunate because i think he should score one as well he has delivered incredible work and same thing with the sound across the board mm -hmm. whether we're mm -hmm. talking about sound mixing sound editing the the score it all comes together right. so incredibly well. And you know, you have you have someone like him in your pool of talent. It's it's as simple as, or at least in my mind, plucking him from one project, putting him on something else doesn't right. have to be the same.
Yeah, I would love it. His work is great. I mean, this because uh, he did Clone Wars as well, yeah. right? So it's like this was the one of the first guys out of the gate uh, with the Clone Wars movies. The first time that was like, all right, hey, that John Williams guy, could you do some of his Something music like for that, us? Right. And he comes out of it. I love the Clone Wars theme, kind of the the, the drums in the background mm -hmm. with the familiar theme. So he's he's been hitting home runs for a long time. Uh, would love to see it again. Like you say, I think it's not as splashy. No, not but splashy. what I think will happen though, I think that even though I don't want it to go this way. Dave Filoni will do another animated series, um, right. which he'll crush, and it'll be great, and Kevin Kiner will go mm -hmm. with him. Yeah. That's, that's what I think will happen, yeah. and it shouldn't, too. It, yeah, yeah. it shouldn't happen, but that's what's going to happen. Um, that's it. I've got to pee really bad, so we're going to wrap this up. Uh, I'd like to thank the council here today. The Grand Moff Nemiroff, where can they find you? Thank you for having me back. I'm on uh, Twitter and Instagram, at pnemiroff. And Kylo Ken. Hey, you can find me at the Knapsack Files podcast feed, also on Twitch, twitch.tv slash Knapsack, playing Star Wars Battlefront, Lego Force Awakens, having fun, hanging out with you guys. And for me, you can find me at Christian Harloff. Once again, please, if you let's have this conversation, because I know not everyone's going to agree with what we're talking about here, but I want to get the overall thoughts. Let's prove to everybody that Star Wars fans, they can come together. The Star Wars fans, we can be reasonable. We can have good conversations. Like, again, I know there's going to be some people in there that are just going to be turds and that happens i understand that as well too but let's try to have the good conversation because i really want to know what everyone thinks overall about what we're talking here and not just the, the the conversation about the creative but in general how are you feeling about everything happened in star wars let's have the chat and once again make sure march 15th you go and check out the live show buy your tickets now at full screen live and then on monday we've got the town hall that will also be going on there it is march 5th 1 p.m est sorry excuse me eastern and 10 a.m pst guys thank you so much for joining us we'll see you next time may the force be with you always Hey everybody, Mark Ellis here. Thanks for watching this episode. You want to watch more? Then click up here. Or you can click right here for more great content from Collider. If you haven't subscribed to Collider Video, do so right now and share this vid with your friends. Thanks for watching.